All right, we want to welcome you to the 1130 Wednesday uh, luncheon where we teach the Word of God and other people eat their lunch. Normally, we, we actually serve lunch at the church, but of course, we're under the COVID-19 shutdown or stay at home now, and uh, the six feet distant won't allow us at this point to be able to come into our church for a luncheon, so we've continued the 1130 luncheon. Uh, at home, uh, you're visiting with me and those who uh, are visiting with us through the internet, not part of our congregation, we hope that you'll stay with us at this 1130, from 1130 to 1230 each day if possible, uh, through your cell phone or something else. You know, you can join us uh, at doctrinalstudies.com, either by Facebook or YouTube as well as our internet. So we invite you to be with us. Uh, we're now teaching, as we have been, on Wednesday and Sunday. We're back on a regular schedule in our church for a one-hour session on Sundays. And uh, what a joy it was to be back with our congregation on Sunday uh, for those who were able to come. And uh, what a joy that was to be face-to-face. -face. But it's, it's a joy to teach. And uh, it's a joy to teach you. Uh, we, we're in a series on Wednesday. Uh, we'll have a few more lessons on it before I turn over to another uh, series of lessons. But we're studying a series called Let Not Your Heart Be Troubled. And uh, it's taken from John 14.1. I did a couple studies out of John 14. And then I moved over to 1 Thessalonians 5, 13 through 26. Uh, especially through 25, 13 through 25, Paul listed as he closed the book of 1 Thessalonians to the church at Thessalonica, he, uh, he, he recorded 16 present imperatives in the Greek language. And you can, you can, they're listed from 13 to 25, 16 present imperative. An imperative is a command, of course, and what we've done, I've gone in and I've picked a few of these out to add to the series, Let Not Your Heart Be Troubled, taken from John 14, 1. And that's where we are. Uh, today, I'm in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. And I've, I've, got, a, I've got a sneaky feeling I'm going to be here uh, two or three weeks on this subject just by the way it's starting to develop in me. But I'm at 1 Thessalonians 5.19, and uh, Paul wrote, Do not quench the spirit. Do not quench the spirit. So when we come back after a word of prayer, we're going to do a study of introdu introducing you to the study of do not quench the spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit who indwells the believer. Don't quench the Holy Spirit who lives inside you. And we're going to talk about what that means and how it's done, and how to recover from it, and all of that. Uh, so, as we do always, we begin our service, our Bible study, with reminding you that the Bible, you know, our Bible, the, the completed canon of Scripture, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it, nor live it in carnality. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, it shows you there's a difference in the Christian life between a carnal believer and a spiritual believer. The evidence of carnality in a believer's life is personal sins. It could be mental attitude type sins or sins of the tongue or overt sins. What do I do to get out of carnality and back to indwelling ministry, back into spirituality of the indwelling Holy Spirit? I confess my sin. 1 John 1, 9 instructs us, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. That cleansing, working off from verse 7 of 1 John 1, is the work of Christ on the cross extended to the Christian life, not for the salvation, but rather for spirituality. I confess my sin to be, to be taken volitionally. I confess my sin to be removed from carnality. It's a desire of my heart and the will of God. At, to put me into spirituality again. And so that's the process. I give you a moment to do that. 
uh, I'll have prayer, and then we'll get into our morning study. And so, our Father, we thank you again for your love, mercy, and grace. We're so thank thankful, Father, to be part of your family. Unconditional grace that saved me by the propitious work of Christ on the cross, was buried and raised from the dead to bring justification to a completed state in my life in Christ. May how thankful I am for that today, Father. I am thankful for the gift of pastor-teacher that allows me, Father, uh, to teach the truth of the Word of God and to stimulate spiritual growth in the Christian. I'm thankful to have a church body in which I have to do that. I'm thankful, Father, for the Internet that allows us to extend our church family beyond uh, the boundaries of our church field uh, over across the United States and the world, uh, far beyond what we could have ever imagined. We thank you for it, Father. Encourage our hearts through the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit today. Uh, through our study, do not quench the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, here's what's interesting. When you look at verses 13 through 25, when you look at the 16 present imperatives that are listed, four of them, now listen to me, four of them are negatives. Four of them are negatives. They have don't do. The rest of them are do this, do this, do this, do this. Four of them are don't do this. I listed those fours on your paper, and if you don't have one, by now you know you're to have your Bible, a piece of paper, and a pencil. <laughs> Come on now. And so when you, look at, when you look down here, when you look at 13 through uh, 25, I'll point them out to you. For example, in verse 15, it is don't repay evil for evil. In verse 19, our study, don't quench the Holy Spirit. In verse 20, don't despise prophetic utterances. In verse 22, abstain from every form of evil. So it's kind of interesting. you got 16 imperatives. Four out of 16 are negatives. These are the things that were hurting uh, the ministry of the church at Thessalonica. That's why they're pointed out. In other words, we would go through and we would highlight these and say, boy, don't get involved in this stuff because this destroys the, the ministry of the other, um, you know, 12, in this case, the other 12 imperatives. So we're going to take a look at this passage, do not quench the spirit. The first thing I want to point out, I think I have, I have three points. <laughs> the last point is long, and it'll probably take two weeks. But the first point is this, to understand the text. Point number one, you must understand the text. Verse 19 is part of, a, of one Greek sentence that goes from 19 to 22. I'm going to say that again. Verse 19 is part of one Greek sentence that goes from 19 through 22. Now, if you have a study guide, and we, John, make sure you have one that you could tape, you know, you can print it off while you're waiting for this to come on and all of that. But I want to show you something. I want to show you something. Uh, look, in, in, now, my New American Standard is not going to be, is not, does not do it the way the Greek does it my Greek text, but in verse 19, do not quench the spirit, do not quench the spirit in the Greek language, and I wrote it on your paper, verse 19 ends in comma. In the Greek language, it ends in comma. Verse 20 and 21, both end with a semicolon. In other words, in verse 19, do not quench the spirit, comma, do not despise prophetic utterances, semicolon, uh, that's the way that's laid out. And then verse 21, verse 21, remember at the end of verse 20, we have a semicolon, and then you have 
but examine everything carefully, hold fast to what is good. Verse 20, verse 21, verse 20 and 21 both have a semicolon. So at the end of verse 21, my New American Standard does have one. It has a semicolon. And then verse 22, abstain from every form of evil, has a period. So what you actually have here in verse 19, you have a comma, not a semicolon. You have a comma in the Greek language. Do not, do, and that, there, that comma hooks, do not quench the spirit with, do not despise prophetic utterances. See, there, those, two, those two are connected with a comma. Then you have a semicolon with, but examine everything carefully, hold fast to that what is good, another semicolon, and then a period. So you have three ideas. Well, I have to explain the Greek text for you to be able to pull this out. Okay? Therefore, now, <laughs> I'm going to tell you one more thing. In verses 19 through, 20, through 22, you, have, you actually have five imperatives. Three of them, three of them are negative. Do not despise, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophetic utterances, abstain from every form of evil. The other two are positives. Verse 21, but examine everything carefully, hold fast to what is good. So you got two positives. You got three negatives. Don't, do not quench the spirit. Don't despise prophetic utterances and abstain from every form of evil. You have two positives in this one sentence. You have examine and you have hold fast. Now I tell you all of that uh, because it's, imp it's important that I tell you what the writer is trying to tell you. Even though I'm going to pull Do Not Quench the Spirit out of this cluster, and I'm going to do a study on it, it'll probably take a couple of weeks, two or three weeks. In 1 Thessalonians 5.19, do not quench the spirit, comma. It connects these two ideas, do not quench the spirit, and do not despise prophetic utterances. What this has just done for us is connect the quenching. What it does, it connects two things with the ministry of the Holy Spirit in, in the church that involves spiritual gifts. Don't quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances. See, prophecy was a gift. You can, you can read that in 1 Corinthians 13. I'm just trying to lay out where this verse comes from. Do not quench it, and he's showing it in the, in, do not quench the spirit in the ministry of the church body. The spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27, talks about a body, the body of Christ. He compares it to the human body with arms and ears and legs. And that's your nomenclature. Whatever your spiritual gift is, he gives it a nomenclature. Whatever that gift is, is a nomenclature to the body. It's a necessary part to the whole wholeness of the body. You, know, you should read 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 12 through uh, chapter 12, 12 through, through 27, who teach, which it teaches that. So, we see that the ministry of the Holy Spirit, do not quench the Spirit, is involved in the Greek language technically with the way the Spirit of God ministers in the body of Christ through gifts in the church. So I'm going to deal with the idea of quenching the Spirit in my lesson today. This takes me to point number two. See, I'm obligated, listen, I know some people go like, why is he doing all that? It gives me all that Greek stuff and all that stuff. It just confuses me. Look, <laughs> 
It's, it's part of the law of homiletics. I've got to tell you what the writer is telling you in order for me to be able to tell you what he's trying to say. I have to do that. You're just going to have to learn if you're going to sit under my ministry. I can't. I have to tell you what the writer is telling us and then take it to some place that stays inconsistent with the writer's teaching. You're going to have to be patient with me because I'm obligated as a pastor teacher wanting to develop spiritual growth in you. I'm obligated to do that. And so under my ministry, you just have to learn that that's important. Uh, whether you're at the stage to understand it or not. You could be a baby believer and you don't understand what I'm saying to you, and that's all right. You could be an immature believer and you just want to get, just get me to the meat. But I can't do that honestly and openly without telling you what the writer's telling us to tell you. I got to tell you what the writer's told me to tell you. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Point number two. The Greek word for quench is very interesting. This word is spelled S-B-E-N-N-U-M-I. S-B-E-N-N-U-M-I. Now, when you pronounce it, uh, sabenumai, sabenumai, it's a very. It looks really difficult. The Greek word really looks difficult. It's a funny-looking word, but it's easy to understand. So that's the good part. It means to put out a fire, to extinguish it, to put out a fire. That's exactly what it means, to put out a fire, quench. Quenching it. Where's, now watch this now. Where's the fire come from? To put it, quench means to put out a fire. Where's the fire coming from? Coming from the Holy Spirit. Don't put out the fire of the Holy Spirit. It's a command. Do not do that. The very important command. He, did, he only gave four of them in this whole series of imperatives. This is a big deal to him. It's the ministry. Don't shut down the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ where it is so necessary to function. Now let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. You already memorized that verse, do not quench the Holy Spirit, so we, don't, we can leave that. So let's go to Acts, the second chapter, where we can actually see where the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is fire. It's, it's identified like a fire in the human vernacular, like a human fire. Now, on the day of Pentecost, chapter 2, we'll pick this up at verse 3. At the day of Pentecost, suddenly there came from heaven, verse 2, a noise like a violent rushing wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. This is Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit from heaven. I've gone through this whole thing. My goodness, I, I spent a whole month on that subject. Uh, I think we put it under uh, the, the Passover of Christ. But Now watch this. And there appeared to them, that's the 120 out of chapter 1, the 120 believers that are waiting for Pentecost and Jesus to baptize them with the Holy Spirit and the church to begin, they, listen, and there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves and they rested on each one of them. Every one of the 120 gathered, these were the, the, the Jewish believers of followers of Jesus Christ at Pentecost in the upper room business. There appeared to them, you got to read chapter 1 to get to chapter 2, all right? I didn't read the whole chapter. You can go back and read it. Well, that's who we're talking, the them, who are the them? All right. There appeared to them 
tongues as of fire, distributing themselves as they rested on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues or languages as the Spirit was giving them utterance. There's our word that is used in verse 20. Utterance. And then it goes on to describe other, other Jews from other nations who had come to the feast of, of Passover that were still present 50 days later after the resurrection uh, for the final festival, Jewish festival, that started with Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, the Pentecost. There's a large number of people still there. And they're identified from verse 4 on, and there are 15 different languages and nations represented of people that the 120 were speaking the gospel of Jesus Christ with clarity to them. I know that from 1 Corinthians 14, 20, 21, 22, 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 22, and say, I know that. You will know it if you read that. So here's what we have. Notice the fire connected with the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Paul's picked that up over here. We're in 1 Thessalonians 5.19. The Holy Spirit is introduced as fire when Jesus baptized the 120 Jewish believers from the upper room business with the Spirit of God at the Jewish festival of Pentecost while he was seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, you can read all of this out of Acts 1 through the second chapter of Acts 2, and this is where the church began. I've explained that to you. When you read chapters 4 and 5, there are, believers are being added to the, to the number from 120, we went to 3,000 and 5,000. If you read up to chapter 5, you'll get all that information. The church has, it is the birth of the church. The 120 went to 3,000, and then it went to 5,000, and then here we are. You know, just, that's fulfillment of Matthew, the third chapter, verse 11. Therefore, quench, don't quench the Holy Spirit is don't put out the fire of the ministry of the Spirit of God that lives in you. Uh, don't put out the fire of the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit in you. That should be pretty clear to you. That's an imperative. Do not do that. Now, here's point number three. And I'm going to see how many of these I can get. I, I won't get them all because you need to understand how important this is. Don't quench the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. It's important to the church, both the local church and the universal church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, over which he sets up the head. Now, here's point number three. We are going to study eight ways not to quench the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you positives to the negative. Don't quench the Spirit. Here's my first point. Walk by means of the indwelling, the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Walk by means of the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. I-H-S, indwelling Holy Spirit. Now watch this. What would quench it? Watch this now. Go with me to Galatians. We're going to go over to Galatians. I'm at Corinthians, so I'm close. Galatians. We're going to go to the fifth chapter of Galatians. And we're going to read this. 16 and 17. I'm in 5, 
16 and 17. But I say, but I say, walk by means of the Spirit, and you will not, it's a promise, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh, your sin nature, Romans 6, the sin nature. It's called the flesh because you get it at birth, and you have it until you die, even though you're saved. What controls the sin nature that you have from birth through Adam, Adamic sin and sin nature comes from Adam. You have it at birth and you will have it till you die even though you're a believer. The power over the flesh or sin nature which is the source of sin through desires of pleasure to sin, the power over that is the indwelling Holy Spirit. You must walk in the Spirit. You will not carry out fulfillment of the desires for the pleasure of the flesh. You won't, go, you won't go back for that second piece of pie that's going to force you to loosen your, your belt which says you just committed gluttony. You could have walked in the spirit, not in the flesh. You could have walked in the desire, the desire of the Holy Spirit to say enough's enough. You're eating for health, not pleasure. You're eating for health, not pleasure. When you begin to eat for pleasure, you're in desires of the flesh, and you can go overboard called gluttony, which is a sin. It's an overt sin, gluttony. Now watch. The word walk, peripateo, means that what I'm going to tell you is in every area of your life, peripateo is just a circle, and your life is inside that circle, and you're always to walk. In that circle of your life, the influences that come out of you and into you, you're to walk, peripateo, by means of the Holy Spirit. In every aspect of life, there's no aspect of your life Look, let, let me let me say, not even the bathroom. There's 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 no off limits to the Holy Spirit. I I know it's a little crude, but I just mean there's no off limits to the Holy Spirit. Under Perry Pateo, there's no off limits. You can't say you, you're going to stay out. I got a date tonight, uh, and uh, you can't you can't ride with me in the car because you can't. You can't stay with me when I take her back, back home and to my room. You can behave that way, but it doesn't. It's, he's, he's in for the duration. Once he takes up residence in your life, he's there forever. You know how I know it? Because the Bible says so. John 14, 16. You should write that one down. Because that's the, that's the key to 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? Don't you know your body is the temple of God, the naos, where God dwells? God, the Holy Spirit, dwells there, and your body's become the temple, and it's not your own. It's been bought through Jesus Christ on the cross, the burial and the resurrection. John 14, 16. He's there forever. Now, let me tell you something else. The word walk, peripateo, it's an imperative. In the Greek language, it's a, pre second, second, it's a present active imperative, second person plural. He means everybody. All of you believers are to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. When you walk in the flesh, you put out the fire of the Holy Spirit. You quench the spirit. When you walk in the flesh, you quench the spirit. The spirit is not capable 
of being able to be the dynamics, the power system. You've shut the power system off. He can't leave you. He don't have the power to do what he's been sent to do. You turn the power off. You walked in the flesh. To get the power back on, you have to confess your sins to get the power back on. Walk by means of the Holy Spirit is a positive, and the negatives don't quench it. In verse 16, well, listen. Here's verse 16. But I say, walk, that's, that's the imperative, walk by, the, by means of the Holy Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. See? You can, you can quench the flesh just like you can quench the Spirit. You can quench the flesh. When you quench the flesh, the Holy Spirit, if you walk in the Spirit, the Spirit will give you the power to quench the flesh. He'll, he'll remind you, listen, you don't need that second piece of pie because you're not eating for pleasure. You're eating for health. You don't need to be guilty about the first piece. Maybe the next time... It, when you ate half the piece, you were full and content. You should have left it alone. I'm not trying to pick on you. I'm just trying to tell, show you the, the way this thing works. Now watch verse 17. Watch verse 17. For the flesh, the sin nature, sets, now it speaks like a person, sets its desires against the spirit. These two are in opposition to one another in your life. Do not quench the spirit, quench the flesh. It's a choice. It's, the ball is in your court. The ball is in your court. But these are in constant opposition. How long are you going to, listen, how long are you going to have the flesh? All, always, right? How long are you going to have the Holy Spirit? Once you get saved, always. So you're going to have them both, always. The question is, and they're in opposition. The question is, are you going to be mature enough in your Christian life to walk the walk in the power of the Holy Spirit? The Christian life is the walk of the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't quench him. Quench the desire of the flesh. Verse 17. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. These are in opposition. They are in constant opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. When you quench the flesh, it doesn't please the flesh. There may be a little sadness in you that you really wanted that for pleasure and you didn't get it. Oh, <laughs> write this down. It's not on your paper. Better write this one down. James 1 14 and 15. It tells you how, well, let me, I'm not going to get through, this is a two-week program anyhow. I can see that right now. 14, 15. Let me show you how, let me show you how this thing, how you're being, how you are tempted away from the ministry of the Holy Spirit. In your own life, nobody's doing it. You're doing it to yourself. These are in opposition within you. Watch this now. I'm in James 1, 14. Each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust, desire. Tempted. Tempted is not a sin. But it tells you how you're tempted. It says tempted when carried away and enticed by the desire of the flesh, 
It's your own flesh. It's inside. All this is going on inside. And it just depends on what kind of lust patterns you have in your sin nature, what you're interested in. You're a person that may eat little. Gluttony is not your problem. Drunkenness, you like booze and drugs. Just to pull a couple off the shelf here. It depends on what your lust patterns are in your life. They, they could be attitude lust patterns. They could be sense of the tongue lust patterns. They could be overt patterns. They could be a combination of all that. Only you know. I don't know yours. I know mine. If you walk in the Spirit, He'll teach you. He'll teach the opposition. He'll teach you the warfare going inside you. He'll teach you how to win over the lust of the flesh. He'll teach it to you if you're a willing partner. So he says, tempted, each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, when it's given birth by volition, I choose it, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth temporal death. In other words, you're out of the ministry of the Holy Spirit where life is. Life and peace is in the ministry of the Spirit like in the 14th chapter of Romans. But here's where you are. You're into sin and, and temporal death. Temporal death is out of the, the life, peace, ministry of the Spirit. All of that went on inside. Carried away and enticed out of James 1, 14 and 15. I want you to look back, back with Galatians with me a moment. Go back to Galatians with me a moment. In the ch fifth chapter, I'm in 2 Corinthians. Let me, get, let me get into Galatians again. I went to James. Whether you did or not, I did. I'm back in the fifth chapter. Jump down to verse 25. Because if you walk in the Spirit, the Spirit gives you the abundant life. The life of Christ, the abundant life that God has desired for your life is in the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 28. If... That's the first class condition. I want to show you what he says. This is the first class condition. And if this is true, this is true. If we live, if we live, that's, the, that's, that's John 10.10. 10. That's the power of, of the abundant life in Christ. If we live by means of the Holy Spirit, then let us also walk by means of the Holy Spirit. You see, walking in the power of the Holy Spirit produces life and peace. Walking in the flesh produ produces sin and death. Temporal death means that you're, you're, act, you're in the same state you were as an unbeliever, but you're a believer. You're carnal. You're carnal. You are carnal. Carnal. You are fleshly. Carnal. A Latin word for the Greek word sark. Sarkikos is carnal. That's 1 Corinthians, write it on your paper, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. What he wants you to be is nomatikos. He wants you to be spiritual. There, he said, I, could I can teach you when you're spiritual. I can teach you when you're carnal. If, if we live by the Spirit, we shall also walk by the Spirit. Do you see that? Oh, people, see that. In verse 25, the word if is a first-class condition. Now let me deal with the second one. There's the first one. If I walk in the power of the Spirit, I will not, I will not walk in the flesh. If I walk in the flesh, I'm quenching the Spirit. Walking in the flesh quenches walking in the Spirit. I don't have the fire dynamics of the power of the Holy Spirit. Has he left? No, he has not left John 14, 16. Now, the second thing. Let me, let me give you the positive and then the negative. 
You know, I said, walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. Here this one is. Be led by the Spirit, not the flesh. Back to Galatians. Back to Galatians. I want you to look at verse 18. Now, this whole subject starts at 13. I want you to pick, I want to pick up 18 and go back and look at it. Look at verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law or legalism, a work system. If you are led, if you are led, that's a first-class condition. If this is true, then this is true. If you are led by the Holy Spirit, you are not under the law, legalism, and a work system, which is flesh. Therefore, if you, if, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not to be led by the flesh. Legalism and law is a flesh system. Religion is a flesh system. That's the whole system of the natural man of 1 Corinthians 2.14. The sukikos. The natural man cannot ascertain the spir spiritual things. He cannot appraise spiritual things. He can't put value. He can put no value to it. Appraisal. You know appraisal? Like you take a car in for an appraisal to find out what is a value that is placed on it, a common value. The natural man can't place a common value on spiritual things because he's an unbeliever. He's under 13 judicial charges of Adamic sin. He's dead. He's in darkness. He's in blindness. He's alienated. It, all those things. You can find him in the 50 things. You could never lose in time and eternity in the package of salvation. Grace. Salvation. 